Monica from FedEx, and I received information about a package you were looking for, some type of Tudor vintage men's watch, but I was calling just to let you know that we did a station search here of where the package should have been delivered, you know, out of our station, and there's nothing here. So it's taken a couple weeks for me to even get to a place mentally where I can comfortably talk about this. But I feel like one of the privileges of having this channel is that I get to share my watch collecting journey with you and that we cover both the good and the bad, just to be fair. Hopefully somebody will listen to this story, take something away from it and prevent this from happening to them. I just want to preface by saying the situation is still evolving, that in this video we're not going to exaggerate or dramatize anything for effect. Just going to try to state the facts. But this is the story of how FedEx lost my $8,000 Tudor Snowflake. So the story starts a while back when I did a couple videos on Tudor. Specifically, I reviewed the Black Bay 58, which by many accounts is the best diver you can get for under $4,000. That watch is dead sexy with its vintage sizing and Rolex fit and finish. But one thing that bothered me was the use of all these geometric shapes on the dial with circles, squares, and triangles. It's just sort of offended my aesthetic sense. So in the video after that, I used some parts I found on the internet to sort of assemble my own version of the Black Bay, which was a 39 millimeter case with a replica Black Bay bronze dial. Now, I don't want to brag, but this was a whole four months before Tudor announced pretty much the exact same watch in the new Black Bay 58 bronze. That was a fun little watch, and I recommend you watch the new video if you haven't, but what I really wanted was a vintage Tudor snowflake. So around this time is when I began my search for a Tudor Snowflake. Uh, this is of course the original Tudor Submariner from the 60s and 70s. They had those square indices with the famous snowflake hands. And these watches have aged really interestingly over the last five plus decades, such that the bezel has turned sort of a baby blue color, uh, whereas the dial having been protected under the crystal has stayed sort of a deep navy blue. Now, a vintage snowflake in good condition is fetching over $10,000 these days, but I was able to find a good one with a service style for eight. What's a service style, you ask? Well, this is when a watch is sent in for service and the manufacturer presumably replaced it with a new one. Uh, this could be because some of these old snowflake dials really fell apart as they aged. And how do you identify a service style? Well, since the snowflakes were mostly made in the 70s when Rolex used tritium, the dial should say T-Swiss T. Other Rolex dials from this era can also say Swiss T25. Rolex switched to Luminova for a few years in the 90s. Those dials will say Swiss only. And in the 2000s, they made the switch to Super Luminova. And so modern dials will say Swiss made. So eventually I got distracted by other projects and that snowflake video never got made. I looked at my collection and realized it was my most expensive piece and I'd rather redirect that fund somewhere else. So I put it up on eBay uh, and it sold without issue for $8,200. So I was off to FedEx to ship it. Uh, I remember going up to the counter and asking what's the most secure way to do this uh, and I was told that jewelry can only be insured up to $1,000. This made me kind of nervous, but at the same time, we do this all the time. We hand our prized possessions off to some stranger to be delivered to some other stranger across the world, and it seems to go without a hitch. Now, the watch wasn't going directly to the buyer. It was through the eBay authentication program, so it was actually being shipped to a jeweler in Dayton, Ohio. They were going to verify the watch and then dispatch it off to the buyer. So fast forward to a couple weeks later, the buyer emails me and says that he still hasn't received the watch. So I checked the tracking number uh, and it shows that the watch has been pending at the Miamisburg, Ohio facility for quite a number of days. 
So this is when I began to worry a little bit because a package typically only spends a few hours at a destination facility before being loaded onto a truck and delivered, especially because I paid for Express. So I frantically call FedEx and I put on the phone with this woman named Penny from the domestic tracing department. Uh, she talks me down, tells me that they're gonna look for the package uh, and that she says a woman named Monica, who is the station manager at Miamisburg is going to call me. I'm at work, Monica leaves me a message. Hi Max, my name is Monica from FedEx and I received information about a package you were looking for, some type of Tudor vintage men's watch. And um, it shows that our location, MWOA, um, actually um, received the package. But after that, there have been no scans since the 22nd. We did a station search and we weren't able to locate anything. So it looks like here you wanted to call back with the update. So um, I was just calling you back to let you know that we did not find anything. So um, I'm more than likely sure that you're probably going to open up a claim on the um, package. But I was calling just to let you know that we did a station search here of where the package should have been delivered, you know, out of our station. And there's nothing here. So um, feel free to give us a call at the 800 number and please reference your tracking number. Thank you. Bye. Well, thank you, Monica, but that's not good enough. How does a package enter your station and just vanish? Uh, since then, I've spent many hours on the phone with FedEx to no avail. So here's my message to FedEx. Shipping is your one job. Somebody's paying you to get a package securely from one place to another. And if you lose it, that should be your responsibility. If I borrow your book and I leave it somewhere, that's my fault. If I borrow your laptop and somebody steals it, that's my fault. If I borrow your car and I crash it into a ditch, again, my fault. Now, I understand with millions of packages shipped that some will be misplaced, but I feel like doing the right thing and correcting the situation ought to be the cost of doing business for a shipping company. Now, I don't have high hopes of getting my watch back or my money back, and eBay has already refunded the buyer. So how do you avoid this happening to you? Well, I discussed this with some people in my watch group and they've had some good advice. Uh, number one, consider shipping to a pickup drop-off hub to avoid that last leg of the journey. Uh, number two, consider using a third-party insurer. Uh, IFS uh, was mentioned, at least in the US. And number three, some people even make a physical trip for really high value items. Uh, I'd recommend meeting at a jeweler or a watchmaker in that case. So that's the situation as of now. Thank you for listening. Making this video has been somewhat of a therapeutic process for me to try to move on from this situation and hopefully you've taken something away from it. Now, I'm not looking for sympathy. Uh, if you have any advice though, drop me a comment below. And don't worry guys, I'll be okay. Um, and I'm sure we'll be back making cinematic watch videos very soon. So thanks guys, take care.